Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, well, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Jorge Aranda, who is currently a postdoc at University of Victoria, um, working with Daniela Damian and Peggy Story at the same time. Um, and uh, he was a PhD student at University of Toronto um, until a year ago and has been a postdoc for one year. And he ha also has the wonderful resume of having worked for Gina Vinolia. Uh, right here <laughs> at Microsoft Research, uh, where he did some pretty influential work on studying uh, some exciting things about what software teams misremember. And he currently works in the areas of looking at collaboration and coordination amongst the members of software teams. So I'd like to introduce Jorge, who's going to talk today about uh, a study he did on understanding roles in software organizations. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thanks for coming. Um, I'd like to start with a, with a picture that, well, Andy has seen this before. Probably you have to because it's been making the rounds online, how, uh, how different people in, um, in IT see each other. Because um, I, I, so, I mean, this is, of course, uh, in jest, but you can kind of see some of the stereotypes that people assign to the different kinds of, uh, of roles in, in software organizations, right? Um, how they see each other, uh, themselves, uh, always the heroes in, in, in all cases, but in different ways, and how everyone else is screwing them up um, in their own way. So um, the, uh, the study that I'm going to talk about is based on the um, observation um, that, uh, that I made a, a while back, that um, we, we have these terms in our literature everywhere, both in, in academia and in industry. We talk about developers and, and designers and project or product managers, QA, uh, etc. But in the firms that I've studied and the groups that I've been to, um, these people apparently are doing different things that when I often see in the literature. So I'll, I'll give you a sample of, uh, of the things. So th these are, these are um, phrases published uh, um, a year or two ago in the academic literature. Um, and um, some of them kind of dear to what I was expecting to find from uh, um, you know, the, the concept that people have on, on roles in software organizations, but some do, do not. So for instance, the first one, um, someone says, non-functional requirements are one of the hardest problems analysts and designers have to deal with during software design. And I agree that software designers have to be thinking of non-functional requirements all the time, but it's just that I've never seen them doing, them, doing it purposefully, right? To, to say, now I'm going to work on non-functional requirements. Um, another on, the similar, on a similar vein, developers identify and manage work dependencies. Again, it's something that I guess they need to be doing um, in, in, their, in their daily work, but it's, it's weird for me to see it spelled out like that because I've never seen a developer discuss dependencies specifically, right? Uh, a weirder one, if a software architect has to model a concern not supported by his own language or tool, this is something that I've never seen. I've never seen a, a software architect uh, modeling concerns at all, no matter what the tool. Actually, I haven't seen anybody modeling concerns. Um, uh, just a few more. Uh, users hardly get any support in creating process models. Okay. Uh, it, that's, that's an understanding of, uh, of what a user does that does not match my own. Um, our proposal provides software designers quantitative feedback they can use to meet a coverage goal. So software designers, I think, in here is being used as um, a term to to refer to software professionals in general and how they want you know, testing coverage. Uh, but a lot of people have associated the label designer with something very different than you know, um, 
uh, establishing the quality of a, of a piece of code. And so on, I'll, I'll skip the last one. The, the point is that in general, reading the, the literature on, on software engineering, I get the, um, this feeling that we're talking about different things, that people talk about a developer or a, a tester uh, or a project uh, manager with a meaning very different from the one that I have uh, and the, the one that I've seen. So um, I, I said, well, I might be wrong too, right? Maybe, maybe my conception of what a software developer is or what a tester is is, is very inaccurate. Um, so I wondered, you know, would it be a good idea to study what are the, the actual roles in software development organizations? And do we even have a consensus? Are, they, are, are there common, well-established roles um, in the industry? Or do they vary a lot across organizations and even, or even within an organization? Uh, do roles change over time in a group? And if so, why? Uh, you know, why what are the reasons that people change their responsibilities? Um, do people in different roles use the same tools? And do they use them in a, in a similar way? And also, what, where do official positions fit in the picture, right? Is, is your title directly related to what you're actually doing or, or not? Um, so, I started, uh, I started doing this, uh, this study without really knowing if this was a problem that needed to be fixed. Uh, maybe it's not. I, before starting, I, I hadn't heard complaints from anyone that said, oh, well, our, our distribution of labor is completely ambiguous and this is leading to lots of problems. Um, and what I didn't want to do was to end uh, this study with a proposal for some kind of standardization or, or certification or something like that. If you want to become a software tester, you know, these are the things that you should be doing. And, and if you want to be a project manager, these are the things that, that you should be doing. Um, but I, I think uh, there are good reasons to study roles in, in, in software organizations, um, mainly because they are related in, in several ways to real concerns that um, uh, managers and, and software professionals have. Uh, so what are the right uh, ratios of, uh, of different kinds of professionals in a group, for instance, uh, let's say developers and testers? Um, oh, by the way, you can feel free to interrupt me any, any time you want. Um, often company policy is very detached from what's actually happening. How can we bring it closer together so that uh, what, what's in, uh, stated in the, in the formal policy makes sense in practice? Uh, oh, but, but by more consistent with what's actually happening in, in a team. So um, uh, to give an example, let's say that uh, the policy states that requirements are written in, in the form of a requirements document, written by an analyst, and passed on to designers and developers. And in, in actual practice, um, maybe there's a, a lot of people bypass that, um, that process. So, uh, you know, it's important to, if, if you care a lot about having policy that's consistent to practice, something needs to, to be changed there. So that's what I mean. And also from, from an academic perspective, it's, it's good to have some conceptual clarity, right? We, we're talking a lot about these concepts. Almost every abstract in, in uh, TSE or ICSI or um, FSC, you know, mentions one kind of software professional. Uh, so it would be good at least to, you know, have a better understanding of what are we talking about. So the first thing I did was to um, go back to uh, sociological literature and organizational science literature to see how um, how they conceive of, of roles in, in um, social groups. It's an old topic for them, right? Um, and the consensus seems to be that um, a role is, or what, what we what we call a role, is an abstraction that we use to refer to a set of expectations placed on someone, okay? The key word here is uh, expectations. So uh, role is um, kind of like at the molecule level, but the expectations are the, the atoms that really uh, uh, constitute it. So whatever a person is expected to do, 
uh, by virtue of their, their position, their status, their, their history, their preference, all of that defines the role. Um, th this means that roles are social constructs. Um, there is a developer is whatever the, the relevant social group determines that a developer should be, right? So uh, a researcher at Microsoft Research is whatever the group decides, perhaps unconsciously or, or uh, unintentionally, that a, that a researcher should be. This also means that there's no prototypical anything. There's no prototypical uh, uh, researcher or developer or tester or anything because these concepts are defined at the group level. And who places these expectations? Well, everyone. Um, teammates, um, so, so for instance, you have someone who is a developer. What does uh, being a developer mean? Well, it means what the teammates think that the developer should be doing, what their supervisors and maybe subordinates think that they should be doing, people they interact with, also people they don't interact with, but with, which, uh, with, with whom they have some, uh, some, some kind of uh, relationship. So um, people who, let's say in Microsoft, um, you could have lots of developers um, who are unknown to uh, another, another division, another department, salespeople or whoever. Um, salespeople don't, haven't interacted with any developer in particular, but they are expecting something to happen in the development group. And that expectation is transferred into the, into the actual developers. Society in general also plays some expectations. And of course, the, uh, the, the person who is enacting the role also has some expectations on what is it I should be doing, given that uh, my social group is, uh, is uh, giving me this role. So there are some problems that come out of this um, conceptualization. The, the first one is that the set of expectations of all of these people is probably not consistent or satisfiable even, right? I get some expectations from, from my bosses and from my peers and from, uh, from other people and there may be no way to make everything satisfiable. Uh, so, so sociologists call this role strain. Um, you're, you're, being, you're, you're, you're being stressed by the different pools that you have on you. And it may lead, into, uh, it may lead to dysfunction. Um, so people are expecting you to do something. You can't satisfy that something. Uh, and so there is a consistent mismatch between the expectations placed on you and, and your behavior. Uh, the, other, the other interesting thing is that since these expectations arise from the group um, that, that, that you're a part of, that means that uh, there's no guarantee that they match those expectations placed on someone with a similar role somewhere else. Now, in some professions, the, the roles and expectations are, are much more uniformly understood. So, for instance, in the medical domain, um, we, can, we can talk of doctors and nurses and anesthesiologists and uh, surgeons. And just naming them, you, you can have a bunch of expectations of what is it that they should be doing, what constitutes normal behavior and abnormal behavior for, from them. Uh, but in our field, I, I, I claim that the... Um, the expectations are not that uniformly understood, that there's a lot of variation. And we're going to see a, a few reasons why. Yes? That's what I wanted to ask before, because it seems that uh, certain professions are more amorphous, and that's why you even can ask these questions, like you were saying, medical field, or I think of like factory workers, there's, no, yeah. there's not much leeway in what their roles are. Uh -huh. So uh, have you found other professions that are more similar to software organizations that you're going to talk about? And, and yeah, that's a good question. I didn't, I didn't specifically look for others that are similar, but I, I can come up with some uh, because uh, I, I think this, this uh, amorphousness, is that a word? Um, comes from a number of factors. I'm going to be going over, over some of those factors, but uh, briefly to anticipate that. Um, the main driver for uniformity is uh, institutionalization, right? So the more institutionalized some role is in, in the larger culture, the more that every instantiation of that role will fit um, that picture. 
Um, so if, if we had, for instance, if we demanded that every software developer had a license or a certification or something, you would expect to see uh, a lot more uh, uniformity. Uh, but I'll, I'll be going uh, in more detail on, on this. Right, so uh, the, other, the other wrinkle here is uh, we need to make a distinction between roles and positions. A position or a title is what, you know, what the business card reads. And sometimes they're the same thing. You could be a software developer in practice, you, know, you, could, you could be developing production code, and at the same time have a business card that says software developer. But these things don't necessarily match. And we, uh, so, so um, sociologists make a distinction between uh, one, you know, a position you occupy, a role you enact. A uh, position is based on uh, a formal policies and a role is based on the norms of, of behavior in, in the social group. So just something to keep in mind. I'll, I'll come back to this. Um, Woody Allen here is the president of some uh, banana republic. and uh, He has the, the official position of president, but his role was slightly different if you saw the movie. Right. Uh, so... So that was a uh, um, brief overview of the uh, theoretical framework that, uh, that we uh, sketched out coming from the sociological literature. Uh, then we, what, what we decided to do, by the way, this is work that I did in collaboration with um, Adrian, Adrian Schreuter and um, Daniela Damian and Peggy Story. We decided to do a field study to test out this theoretical framework and um, try to modify a little bit if, if uh, observations didn't match our, our expectations. Um, so it was a case study of two organizations. And I need to tell you a little bit about uh, both organizations because a lot of the examples I'm going to give in a few minutes use uh, information from, from those organizations. So they're both small, fairly small, um, especially for Microsoft centers. They're pretty, pretty damn small. Uh, about 50 people the first one and 25 the second one. Uh, the uh, 50 people one, which I'll call company A, um, is, um, it does software for um, uh, bioinformatics. Um, it has a development team of 17 people, mostly developers, uh, some testers. This group is subdivided in, in development teams and they have about 30-something folks uh, doing other kinds of stuff. Sales, uh, field support, project management, product management. They have like five VPs. Um, this company is, uh, was, by, by the time I, I went to spend time with them, I spent three weeks with them. Uh, they were going over a rough patch. They had a downsizing uh, two weeks before I arrived. Uh, they lost, I think, about 15, 20 people, but it was the second downsizing they had, they had uh, gone through. So things weren't going super um, for them. It was interesting for us because we could see, you know, how, how responsibilities were changing as people were adapting to their new uh, situation. Um, the second uh, group which I'll call Company B, although it's not really a company, it's a, a publicly funded group. It's part of a, um, a research institute. Um, and they're tasked with providing uh, data and data analysis services to uh, scientists all over Canada. And because they do it over the internet and the internet has no real boundaries, um, to scientists all over the world. So. They receive data from uh, a bunch of places and they, they process it on site and they develop software to help people access it, mine it, um, uh, store versions of it, etc. So it's a smaller group and it's subdivided in, in, three, in three parts. We have the, the development side, software developers, um, which are about uh, eight people, if I remember correctly. Uh, they have scientists, um, a bunch of scientists who also do a little bit of development, uh, mostly scripts. Uh, and they have operations, an operations group, which is charged with um, providing data and, and services and, and ensuring that, uh, um, that they have a good uptime and that everyone's data is safe and so on. 
All right, so I spent in total five weeks at, uh, at both places. I, uh, I conducted 36 interviews of about an hour each. That comes to about 50% of the total staff at, at both sites. And um, so we ended up with a bunch of stuff, uh, a, lot of, a lot of examples that cannot be summarized very, very easily. But we also came up with, uh, with this table, which I know you won't be able to read. I'm sorry about that. Um, I, I, I couldn't come up with a, a better way to, to explain it. Um, so what is this? This is, we, we got a lot of information from people when I, when I asked them, okay, what, what is it that you should be doing here? What are you expected to do? If you go, what's going to happen to the organization? What do you expect from other people, et cetera, right? And so then I analyzed all of that and I came up with this list of expectations that, uh, that people have. And the original list was much longer, but some of the expectations were too detailed and so I, I removed them because I was looking for something more uh, universal to, to share. Um, and I also uh, clustered the, the expectations by area. So you have the technical core. The first few rows are the technical core, uh, which means you know, actual development of software, uh, fixing bugs, maintaining legacy code, uh, and, and script, uh, scripts that, that uh, or customizations that you need to do on, on the base uh, systems. And then, um, in the, in the columns in here, you have a bunch of people which I mostly classified by their positions more than by their roles. Although I made a, a couple of exceptions. For instance, uh, the, the second company had, did not have official team leads, but two people were really doing more team leading stuff. So I put them over here. Um, in, in each cluster in here, you can see um, a small subdivision. That means company one and, and company two. And each of these squares is colored by how much people expect that person to do something, right? So white means we're, we don't expect you to do this. Uh, light gray means, or gray means you're somewhat expected to do this. And um, a black means you're highly expected to do this. Now this is subjective. Uh, this, this comes from interview data. Um, my interpretation of that interview data. Uh, but I'll go back to this because I think this could be the basis for some uh, more um, objective analysis or, or at least more of a self-reported analysis of expectations in, in software groups. Anyway, uh, a few patterns that are, I think are interesting here. Yeah. Are these, those people you interviewed perceptions of what other, expectations of what other people thought that they should do or does it also combine what they thought other people should be doing? Uh, yeah, both. Both of them. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, this is, this is uh, only the people that I talked to. Uh, if I included everyone in both organizations, the table would be twice as long, but I had less information for the people that I didn't talk to. So I, I left those out. This is a subset of, of all the people in, in both organizations. You try to get, are there any, um, like, I can do it in the world, but like positions that you didn't have coverage of? Uh, no, uh, so I tried talking to people in every group. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, well, one exception. Um, there's a significant sales team in company one, and I didn't talk to any of the salespeople. And there's a sysadmin at company one as well. I didn't talk to the sysadmin. But other than that, uh, uh, I covered uh, all the groups. Yep. When you asked them about expectations of others, were they referring to individual people, like John, like I expect John to be a developer or to write code, as opposed to all developers, whoever they are? Yeah. Should be so, code. so I, I was looking for the first uh, kind of response. So you know, John should be doing this. I often got, I, I often first got the second kind of response. Uh, developers should do this, and if that if that was the case, then I would push them and say, okay, who who in development should should be doing this? Um, and that's, that's what I went with. Yeah. So um, I noticed that you mixed QA and ops, and you also mentioned sysadmins yeah. as maybe being even a subset of, right. in some cases, what ops is doing. But what was, the, uh, what was your reasoning for combining those when you were surveying? Uh, yeah, uh, a practical reason, actually, which is that I only had one person from ops. Gotcha. Um, and 
looking at what that person was doing, it had a lot to do, to do with, um, I'll explain that in a moment, but uh, a lot to do with quality assurance as well. So I just lumped that person together with the others. And so really, uh, and I know it's a small sample size, but really you, it sounds like there, there, there wasn't a lot of operation I mean, as, as a specific discipline in the two companies. That's right. So remember, the, 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 uh, the one company that had operations, uh, an operations group, uh, there were four people in that group. And the, the information you see here is from the head of that group, which is the person I interviewed. Yeah. Seems interesting. I'm struck most by the, uh, the places that you get most uniformity and most non-uniformity. Right. Exactly. So uh, a, a few of the interesting patterns that I that I uh, came up with. Uh, the first one is um, this this cluster here around the technical core, um, and how you can spread out of working on the technical core in two main ways. You can either spread out the way that the tech leads do by designing system architecture, taking the toughest problems and providing some historical perspective. You kind of become a bit of a team historian. Or the other one, the, the path of the team leads, which is more towards uh, management, uh, reporting what the team is doing, um, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so that's one. Another one is you can't really see it very well uh, uh, in the table, but there are very few people that have expectations placed in the technical side, in the, uh, in the management side, and, uh, and in providing some domain legitimacy or, or being you know, domain experts. Uh, let's see if I can find. So this one, for instance, uh, this, this person, um, works a lot with, uh, with directors in determining the long-term vision for the product, uh, provides domain legitimacy to the organization. I'll explain what that means in a moment. Um, also is working on coordinating product release, uh, writing documentation, and, and, and so on. So that person is all over the place. Those people were very rare. But in the interviews, um, other people constantly refer to them as key for the organization to keep on, keep on going, right? Uh, for one of those, I think it's this person um, who is, again, all over the map. Um, someone said, well, if that person leaves, we may just, you know, close the doors and, 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 and turn off the lights because there's nothing else we can, we can be doing here. Um, yeah, I was actually I was referring to, like, under maintain legacy code and the developers. Uh, yeah. In, in the larger organization. Right. You know, it varies from black to white. Yeah. Where it's like... Advocate for resolution of user customer problems. Yeah, it's all black or gray For everybody in the support, you know, it's either it's true, right? There's yeah. not this variance now um, I should warn you not to read too much into the actual Details because this is only half of the organizations, right? Uh, but you're right and I can explain this uh, this this thing here um, In that larger organization remember there's there's several sub teams and one team was charged with um, the, uh, the, main, the main product that they were working on, uh, which was kind of old and uh, difficult to work with. And so a lot of what they were doing was just solving bugs and, and working on the roadmap uh, features that they had. The company also wanted to move away from that. And so they, had, they created this splinter group um, that shouldn't be concerned at all with legacy code whatsoever. And you know, they had supposedly a blank slate to be working on. So that, that's, that's the reason why, really why you get that. These are questions were about specific people, not yes. the role in general. Right, right, yeah. Um, and uh, just one more pattern. There were some expectations that are very weakly spread all throughout the organization. So for instance, writing low level or unit test code. A lot of people have that expectation weekly. It's like everyone says, oh yeah, well, we should write uh, unit tests. Uh, we, should all, we should all ensure that our, our code is fine. Uh, or documentation. Yes, we're all in charge of documentation. But nobody's really charged with it. You know, it's just everyone expects everyone else to play nice and, and do some of this. Yeah? When you're asked about expectations, did you ask also how significant that expectation was for that person or for that role? and whether or not that person was meeting their expectations? Yeah, so, uh, yes, I did, both. Um, 
although not not always systematically but um so sorry the first part is whether is is like what you're saying is how important is that expectation to that person like is that a significant part of their job or is that do yeah do you spend a lot of time doing this like, and like you said, testing if, writing test code yeah didn't seem particularly important to them yeah I, I should also add that I also spent time observing what, what they were doing, right? And so, you know, I interview someone and, and they say, oh yeah, we should unit test. And then, you know, I, I talk to the QA person and I say, um, do, you, do you have a set of unit tests to start with? Or, no, of course not, nobody's writing them, and, you know, that kind of thing. So you also, as usual, I, I, usu I usually get conflicting accounts and it's, you know, it's a bit hard to uh, determine where reality is. Um, yeah, anyway, so um, as you see, there are some patterns and you can kind of classify a little bit of, you know, what, what people are doing based on their expectations, but there's also a lot of role variation. Um, these are all uh, murder solving detectives, but everyone does it their own way. Um, so, so just like we have that with them, uh, it was difficult for me to find uh, people with the same roles in significant detail in the organizations that I, that I studied. And I wanted to give you a, a couple of examples of that and an important exception. So in company one, there were three people that were doing product management stuff. Uh, everyone called them product managers, um, but, and I talked to, to all three of them and they were doing it very differently, each of them. So the first one, uh, was mostly doing actually product design. Uh, he was concerned with uh, a little bit of the architecture, talking a lot of with, uh, with tech leads and so on. Um, the second one were a different team. So the, they were all, each of them working on different teams. Second one uh, was mostly working on, you know, a, a documentation way of, of doing product management, trying to specify um, uh, uh, the architecture, the APIs of the, of the systems. Uh, writing the documentation himself and so on. And the third one uh, had a more external facing uh, kind of product management. So what, what uh, he did, remember this is a bioinformatics company. He had a PhD in bioinformatics and was doing a lot of, you know, talking with clients, figuring out what they wanted and trying to bring that into, into, the, into the development. So three product managers, three very different ways of, of, of doing it. Uh, the same thing happened with, uh, with team leads. Uh, everyone had a different kind of set of expectations of uh, uh, what they should be doing as team leads. With developers, um, some people had to do more documentation, some people had to do more requirements and design. Some people were just expected to take this, this uh, description and produce code that matches the, the specification. The one important exception <coughs> to this role variation finding was project managers at uh, the first company, at company one. Uh, I talked to, um, to two of them and I observed the third one at, at work. And uh, by the way, there were just three, but all three were doing pretty much the exact same thing. Um, the variations were, were there, but were minute. And when I talked to them and asked, why are you, you know, <laughs> I, I talked to them late in the, in the study and I was a bit surprised to see such uniformity. I asked them why, why is that the case and, and they said that it was intentional and part of it comes from a certification. So all of these are project management professionals, PMPs. Uh, so they have the cert their certification, they have their uh, body of knowledge um, uh, and their processes and they were actively trying to enforce their own interpretation of what a project manager should be doing in the organization into everyone else. So this is the way we are going to work. Here are our policies and, you know, get on with the program, right? So that was an interesting exception to, to this role variation. Everyone else was kind of like mocking around, but project managers were fixed on an idea of what they should be doing. Okay, so I'll go back one slide. Um, an interesting question for us was, what makes some people in here uh, take some expectations? How, why are expectations clustered in, in the ways that they are and not in others? Um, and so we came up with four kinds of factors that make 
certain people attract some kinds of expectations uh, or, or some expectations and not others. The first kind of factor is uh, institutional and th this is what, uh, what I was talking about earlier. This is the case of the project managers, for instance. They, there is a relatively strong institution of what a project manager should be doing. If you're trained like that, you come into an organization, you're told you're a project manager and you know what to do, right? But the same thing happens to some degree with other, with other roles. So for instance, a tester. You know, if you're hired, hired into a company as a tester, even without anybody telling you anything, uh, you say, well, I mean, I guess I should be writing some tests, right? I should be, I should be <laughs> uh, checking the quality of, of, of the code that uh, people pass on to me. Um, and when other people hear that you are a tester, they expect certain behaviors from you. So this comes from the larger culture, from, from our institutions of what a software organization is like. Um, I have an example of this uh, coming from uh, company one. For several years, the company was just chugging along as a, as a startup, uh, growing kind of organically. It hit about 15 to 20 people. And then they acquired a lot of venture capital. Um, after acquiring venture capital, they had to change their ways. The venture capitalists expected this. So they had to put in a CEO, a bunch of VPs. They needed a sales group because every self-respecting software company should have a sales group. They needed to have project managers, a product management department, QA department, resource, uh, 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 human resources uh, department. So all of these structures just came into the organization. Uh, um, Externally, it's just what a company like this was expected to be doing uh, by the venture capitalists. Um, this probably was not the wisest move for them, I don't know, but, um, but, but it is an example of how you know, the larger culture affects what, what you're doing internally. Yes? Did either of the two companies have training programs for new hires? Like if you hire somebody as a tester, you teach them? what it means to be a tester in your organization and what tools you use and how to do it? No, to, to a very limited extent. The only ones that have that are developers and the training is done by other developers. Uh, for instance, they have a wiki with uh, uh, ex uh, problems to get you started, right? So, um, so, you know, the first thing you need to do is to be able to build an, uh, our, our, our system. Here are the instructions. You know, the first day you're, or whatever, wherever, uh, whichever day you're, you're supposed to do that. Then after that, you know, make these small modifications, see what happens and so on. Uh, some teams have that better structured than others. A second kind of factor that affects how expectations are clustered is, uh, you know, uh, uh, historical factors. Uh, so, you know, like a tree, you, you bend it some way. It, if it doesn't die, it just keeps on growing that way. Um, or like, for instance, you have a patch of lawn, people start to walk over it in the, you know, in the same ways, and suddenly you have a path, and one day someone decides to pave that path, it becomes official. Uh, so that's, that's the thrust of what I'm uh, talking about here. Um, the expectations that people have in a, in, a, in a group partly come from what they used to be doing before, or, or other people enacting their role used to be doing before. For instance, at company one, there was, when there was all this expansion, this VC funded expansion going on, uh, there was a guy that they hired for the um, QA lead position and later moved on to become a program manager. When the layoffs came in, uh, they gave him a choice to either uh, go out uh, or become a, a tester, a QA analyst. He decided to take the latter but at the same time, um, this, this guy knew a lot of what was going on at a higher level in the organization. He was still, while I was there, um, even though he was a, a QA analyst, he was invited and participated in decisions that did not correspond to those of the other QAs. Right? He, he was still attending some management meetings. He still had some uh, contacts that the company was exploiting in, in some ways. Um, in, in short, people were expecting from him things because of uh, what had happened in, in, in the past, not because of his uh, position or, or uh, the institutional version of what he should be doing. A third set of, set of factors 
uh, structural. So uh, if, you're, if you're a slave in this line, you don't have much choice on um, uh, what you can do, and, and your, the expectations played on you are you know, pretty, pretty uh, simple. Just keep on pulling. Uh, but uh, if you're in, in some other point in the structure of the organization, you may have much more leeway and ability to influence uh, and, and to interact with others in the organization in some ways. So an example of this in the second company I studied, in the second group, the head of operations that I, that I mentioned before, um, he had a unique position where he was the contact of the whole group with um, the, the computing center with the head of the software group, with the head of the science group, uh, with the ba database personnel, with all, all, all of the people uh, below him. And so that gave him more, more ability to do some things, but it also placed on him a lot of expectations coming from uh, many different ways. These expectations, just to repeat, come from his position in the organizational structure, not from, from, from anything else. <clears throat> and finally, uh, personal factors. Uh, everyone brings something different to, to the role that they enact, right? Um, so it could be that you're not very good at doing what you're expected to be doing. It could be that you're very proactive and do far more than uh, what is expected of you. And that performance, uh, that uh, divergence of your performance against your, your original expectations changes what people expect from you. Uh, the second company, there was this, this guy, a project administrator. He was, this was really a clerk position. He was supposedly just in charge of you know, keeping track of the payroll and, and the, the budget of the, of the projects and so on. Um, but he, I mean, the, the, the job was not satisfying for him like that. So he started taking on more stuff. And, um, and the rest of the people got used to that, got used to him knowing all the terms and knowing what was the status of the bugs and, and all of that and keeping track of all of it. When he took some vacation time, oh, not, not vacation, when he took a leave to fulfill another position in the, in the group, uh, the project administration role was, was crumbling down and everybody was, because um, everybody was expecting stuff to happen from the replacement of this guy that was not happening. Uh, by the time I was spending time at that company, they were re-drafting uh, the, uh, the description of the position so that the personal factors in this case, the, um, the characteristics that this person brought into the role, became official policy after, after a few years. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Right, so earlier I talked about the difference between roles and positions. Um, the, uh, we found both an overlap in some ways between what a person is expected to do by the group and what the position is, but also some mismatch. And we, we came up with, the, with an explanation for this. Your position, your title, represents your placement in the organizational structure, so it's a structural factor. Um, and it also defines to a large extent the, uh, the institutional expectations placed on you. So you are um, a project manager. Okay, you're placed in a certain position in the organization to satisfy the expectations of a project manager, so structure. And your title represents, you know, you, you should be managing projects. So you should be doing a certain kinds of things, uh, kind of things. But your position does not define anything, um, does not have to do with the, uh, the historical and the personal factors that I also talked about. So a lot of the distinction between what your role is in practice and what your official position is comes from the dif difference between what you bring to the, to the organization and what the uh, formal policy of the organization is. Uh, by the way, this is... Uh, I don't know if you recognize him. This is from The Wire, a TV show, and it's full of people that diverge from their positions trying to do some other role that was not formally placed on them, and it doesn't always end well for them. All right, so um, we also asked ourselves what makes a role evolve over time, and there are many things, but we focused on, on two. The first one is organizational growth. 
as an organization grows, sociologists tell us, and our data confirms this, uh, you have more specialization. And it is easy to see, to see why this would work in, in practice. So in the smallest possible company where you have just one person doing everything, that person has, you know, that person's role includes all the expectations uh, uh, of the organization. But as that person, you know, keeps hiring other people, the expectations are more spread out, more specialized. And by the time you, when, when you reach a larger group, uh, you have a much heavier specialization or much more detailed specialization than before. So that was, that's one of the things that, uh, that drives um, role evolution. The other one, I briefly alluded to it before, <clears throat> is the uh, mismatch between expectations and, and behavior. So um, either through a failure to meet the expectations placed on you or through contributing more than what's expected from you, the other people adapt, right? They, they learn to expect the new normal over time. Um, I gave you several examples of this already, but just one more. The, the, the head of the science group in the second company that I was talking about um, was hired as a scientist just to, you know, do whatever it is that scientists do, uh, but started to get involved uh, uh, in uh, the software development side of, of things without knowing anything about it at start. Uh, by the time that I spent time with this company, he was attending all the, uh, uh, all the uh, meetings for the development group, uh, chipping in into what, uh, what the product should be doing, how it should be behaving, what do the user community think about it. And he became a very important uh, voice within the group, um, just thanks to his own initiative. Now people expect this from him. If he leaves, they, they, will, they will miss that heavily. Uh, one more finding and we're done. Um, I, we also looked at what kinds of media people used based on the, on the role that they had um, and how do they, did they use it. A problem for this, um, for this observation was that, you know, these are small companies completely co-located, so a lot of the interaction was face-to-face. But moving beyond the face-to-face, -face, what kinds of artifacts people use to communicate? Well, the broadest medium used in both organizations was the issue tracking system. Okay? Uh, but its use was not uniform. So um, developers and QA people used it a lot to have a conversation going through the issue tracking system. But other people also interacted a lot in, in or took a lot out of it in, in different ways. So for instance, team leads were interested in the aggregate information. What's the overall activity going on? They get information from the uh, issue tracking system even though they don't put a lot in, the, in it. Um, product managers use it to keep track of uh, the general progress of uh, particular kinds of features. Uh, the director of software development in both places uses it to get a very you know, a uh, high-level view of, of things. He uses more the dashboard than anything else. Uh, project managers use it. So, you know, people all over use issue tracking systems. But if you just look at who is communicating through it, uh, you miss a lot of the people who are listening or, you know, taking the aggregate uh, activity uh, out of it. Uh, we were interested in this because of the, uh, of the earlier uh, research project that Andy mentioned uh, when he introduced me, the, the one we did here with, uh, with Gina Venolia. And we speculate that perhaps part of the reason why sometimes software repositories are uh, incomplete or misleading is that they're just capturing one kind of role, one, interaction between just a few roles and uh, missing all the other people that are part of the conversation, but in a more passive sense. Uh, other media, it, the use of other media was more localized. So for instance, um, chat, IRC, was used with some development teams, but project managers didn't use it. Uh, the customer support people used Google Docs to keep track of uh, cases from, from uh, their customers. Nobody else had access to these documents. Uh, email and phone were more prevalent for managers. Developers rarely used 
uh, either, especially phone. Okay, so, so what? So I, I went over a theoretical framework to make sense of uh, roles in software organizations. I argue that looking just at the role level may be a misdirection that we need to look at the actual expectations placed on people. Um, um, and to distinguish between what a role is and, and what a position is. And I think, at the very least, this should give us better foundations to talk about different kinds of software professionals. Uh, and even though we're just uh, beginning to, to do this, I think it would help us to design better, better studies about uh, organizational structure and organizational uh, design. Uh, for instance, remember that table I showed you earlier? We could devise a, a survey or, or, or some study based on something like that. Have it self-reported instead of derived from, from interviews to make data collection easier. Uh, and from several people, you could get a, a three-dimensional uh, matrix of um, uh, what people expect from each other and what they think people expect from them. And start to analyze uh, misunderstandings in, in placement of expectations within the organization. Um, so something like this, I think, could lead to better role definitions. Uh, it could help to study bottlenecks and, and deficiencies in the organizational structure what kind of expectations are just placed on one or two people and we lose those people, you know, the company's in trouble. How to fix that? Um, yeah, and finally, some, some brief observations. Role-based differences in media use, so the fact that people in different roles use different kinds of media or use them in different ways, uh, could point to a systematic omissions in repository mining, so... Um, that's something to pursue later on. If in your organization you're concerned about role specialization, um, you're right to be concerned and, and it's, it's important to realize that um, if you want a team of generalists, even though you're perhaps having someone specialized briefly on something and then come back to the general group the way that uh, Agile proponents advocate, that short-term specializations, unless you actively try to fight it could, uh, could lead into uh, a more hard to break uh, long-term specialization, role specialization. And finally, if, you, if we just take the labels of the roles, if we just talk about you know, project manager, or developer, or, or product manager, that may obscure the, the true contributions that, that people bring into, the, into, the, um, into their teams. Uh, if, you're, if you're just a project administrator, you may not other people may not realize all the other stuff that you're bringing into the uh, into the project. And I think I will end there. Uh, if there's any other questions, I would be very happy to take them. So, do you have any um, plans or where of additional research to? I mean, obviously, you know, it's good to start somewhere. Um, yeah. But you know, varying sizes of organizations, um, uh, larger organizations, because I think that's. You know, it's, it's a good start, but what's interesting to me is, as I talk to some colleagues, especially outside of Microsoft, even within Microsoft, yeah. especially with the generalization point you made, there, there, there definitely tends to be a movement, well, I shouldn't say definitely because it's anecdotal, but there, to me, intuitively, there feels to be a movement towards trying to generalize, or at least there's more Venn, di you know, a Venn diagram between these roles, uh, right. and, and trying to break down some of the walls. Yeah. You mentioned not just the, the the, the last point made about even the, just the uh, role contributions um, uh, maybe not being realized, uh, but they also the, the potential contributions may also be constrained by the role as well, right? That's true. Um, well, yeah, so to answer your question, definitely uh, a study in a larger organization uh, is, is something that we would like to pursue. Um, and also other domains, because, you know, like web yeah. is huge, yeah. and that may, there may be domain specific <laughs> things about roles that we don't understand yet as well. Yeah, so uh, in the sh short term, in the fairly short term, uh, if all goes as planned, we're going to do something similar with a, a particular group at a very specialized, in a very specialized domain in a, a large company at General Motors. Uh, we're also pursuing other um, uh, replications of this in, in other sites. Uh, what I should point out is the theoretical framework 
if we got it right, should still apply. But it would still be interesting to see the, the variations uh, in, in different settings. The, the big one is we expect to see more specialization in larger organizations, um, even, even though you try to fight it. Yeah. Uh, yes? Did you see your organization in your roles where the, the roles were, were the expectations like codified or like written down anywhere? Or, or did it really appear that people just kind of got expectations from picking other people in the same role yeah. and other people in the company and just kind of inferred what the expectations were? Uh, to a very large extent, in both sites, um, there was no formal, no correct formal representation of what the expectations are. The second site, remember, is publicly funded, so there, the uh, the position has a description for for everyone. That description often does not match what they're actually doing. Um, in the first site, I got several people. For instance, uh, one of the product managers I was talking about, the one that has a PhD in, in bioinformatics. He says, well, I was, I was hired in as a product manager. I didn't know what a product manager does, and nobody told me. I thought, he says, that what a product manager should do is to you know, be in touch with, uh, with users and with, you know, with the user community and kind of tell people inside what would work and what wouldn't work. He was um, frustrated and a bit confused by the amount of control he was expected to have of the direction of, of the product. Uh, he should be saying, you know, work on this, not on that, instead of, I think, maybe this is a nice avenue to pursue. Uh, with time, he learned, you know, to, to adapt his, uh, his own behavior to the expectations that people placed on him, right? Um, and the role became more similar. His role became more similar to that of the other product managers in, the ter in terms of defining what the, what the team is going to do. But this came from trial and error, uh, in his case, and in many others. Uh, in these groups. Can I ask one more question? Sure. So, at the beginning, you posed this question: Is is there really a problem here? Yeah. Or not? In your interviews, did it did these people express like a desire to have a better understanding of their own roles and expectations on them, or was it like, yeah, it's kind of fuzzy, but you know, we're fine as you know, they're. It doesn't need it. Yeah, um, great question. I think, so, if I remember correctly, nobody said, I would like a better definition of what I should be doing now, although I would have liked it before when I was figuring it out. I think, in general, people like fussiness for themselves because it's more convenient, right? I mean, I didn't know I was supposed to be doing this, so you can't blame me, right? So, so in, in a sense, you know, it, it helps you to have that fussiness, it doesn't help you when other people have it. And I did hear complaints that, you know. Other people have it about you? No, what, so, so I, what I got a lot of was stuff like, especially in the first company, um, these folks should be doing this, you know, X, um, and they're not doing it. All the time we, we have to go in and do it ourselves. You know, that, that's not the way it should be, right? So you'll, I'm, I'm just, um, hypothesizing here, but people, it would appear, do not like concreteness on their own descriptions, but would appreciate it on, on other people's uh, descriptions. The other thing that wasn't covered in the study is almost the opposite, because you said there's some downsizing to very small, but if there, let's say there's another round of VC funding, all of a sudden, you know, company A wanted to double their size, so their engineering team, yeah. and then again, like your first point, is there a problem? Well, yeah. What? Who, which roles do I hire? What's the ratio of, of people yeah. that I hire? And I think that's where you might get into, you know, where that fuzziness can help, can, can possibly Yeah, that's help. right. Yeah. 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 Yes. Did you take these results back to the companies? And if so, what was their reaction? Um, I am taking them next week. <laughs> I'll tell you then. So I have a presentation with the first company in, uh, on Monday. Like yeah, so it. informally, the, the one, the, the only person I talked uh, uh, this, uh, I talked about this with was the uh, director of uh, software development. Um, nothing here struck him as surprising him, but uh, we'll see about the rest of the organization. I'll report back. All right, well, let's thank our speaker. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you.